Okay, so we're going to go ahead. This is session one in our class, Understanding the End Times. And, you know, I, I said in the last session that we're, we're breaking this class up into four different mini courses so that we can have some feeling of completion because it's going to be fairly long. And now we're starting part one, which is called Scoffers and Doctrines of Demons. Scoffers and Doctrines of Demons. And this is going to be session one, loving the truth in part one. Make sense? And so in this session or in, this, in, in part one, we're going to really dig into loving the truth. And we're going to talk about different doctrines of demons that are really becoming popular in the body of Christ. What they are, what they're teaching, things like that. And you'll understand what I'm talking about a little bit later. But uh, in this session, loving the truth, we're going to open up right now by talking about, let's go ahead and turn our Bible to 2 Peter chapter 3. And a couple things, just as a way of review, as we're turning to 2 Peter, just a couple things to review for us. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 is, and I said this, I said this in the, the first introduction or whatever, in the introduction, is this class is really all about setting the context for God's ultimate intention being fulfilled. Is this class is setting the context for how God's ultimate intention will be fulfilled. We'll have an entire class called the Eternal Blueprint that talks about exactly what God's eternal purpose is. But this end time class, understanding the end times, sets the context for uh, how God's eternal purpose is going to be fulfilled at the end of the age. And another thing I want to stress is that it is more important to be ready than to be right. That's super important. A lot of people get very caught in, and I, I, listen, I want to be spot on with what I believe. I, I don't want to teach any error. I don't want to believe any error, any of that. But at the end of the day, it is more important to be ready than to be right. You can have all of your doctrine perfectly laid out. You can understand exactly what's going to unfold. You can understand where the Antichrist is going to rise up from. You can understand who the harlot Babylon is, all about Israel. You can understand every doctrine and every single thing perfectly. But if you're not ready for the Lord and his second coming, what good is that at the end of the day? You just have a bunch of knowledge. And so as important as it is to get our doctrines right, we even more, even more is we want to be ready. That's very, very important. The, the other thing I'll, as a way of review is we're going to use the word over and over, eschatology, eschatology. You know, if you get bored in a conversation with your family, just bring up the word eschatology, and that'll certainly bring uh, some strange looks to you. But that means the study of the end times. The study of the end times. That's what it, this is, long, fancy word that basically means the study of the end times. And so now, in this session, we're talking about loving the truth. And Peter makes an incredibly interesting statement. In 2 Peter 3, verse 3, he says, Know this first of all. It's interesting. Peter's about to teach about the end of the age. And he says, know this first of all. In other words, he's saying to us, this is super important for you to understand as you try to seek to understand the end times. Is know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers are going to come. And you could also use the word scoffers are going to come. I think one translation uses the word scoffers. Mockers and scoffers are going to come following after their own lust, and they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? Now notice this. He says, the mockers and the scoffers are going to say, for ever since the fathers fell asleep, notice carefully, the mockers and the scoffers call them their own fathers. The mocking and the scoffing is not going to come from outside the church, but from within the church. Did you catch that? The mockers and the scoffers are going to arise within the church. And I can tell you, in 2009, I wrote a class for life school about the end times. And the amount of mocking and scoffing related to the end times from 2009 until now has increased dramatically. 
I mean, it, it, and I'm going to give you an example here in a minute. I could have used many, many different examples, but, there's, but the, the amount of scoffing and mocking that's coming up within the church is dramatically increasing. And Peter says, know this first of all, scoffers and mockers are going to rise up and they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? You're always talking about the end of the age. And every single generation thought, well, he's coming back, he's coming back. And every single generation was wrong. You know, we, relax, we've got many, many more years before he comes back. There's a lot of that kind of talk in the body of Christ today. As they're saying... Where is the promise of his coming? Where is the promise of his coming? And I want to give you one example here, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. And this is from Chris Vallotton, a leader in Bethel, Bethel in Redding, California. And he lists on his blog eight eschatological core values, his eight eschatological core values. And so just, just want to give you a little background. Chris is a preterist. He believes that the uh, prophecies in Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation have been fulfilled. And so I, I wanted you to, I want to read what he said. I'm going to make a couple comments, but I want you to detect the tone of scoffing and mocking that is in the body of Christ. And you know, if you know Chris Vallotton, he has a tremendous influence. Bethel has tremendous influence. And again, this is not attacking a person personally. This is more uh, talking about what they're teaching. And we're, and we're going to get into a lot of that in a later session. But anything, anytime I ever bring up anyone's name, it is not in any way a personal attack on any person. We want to always speak with love and honor. We do not want to ever be a heresy hunter or be one of those that are filled with, you know, this complaining and gossip or any of that stuff. The Lord is not into any of that stuff. It is really possible to to love people and honor people and uh, just, just you, know, say, you know, say good things about people while also saying the things you disagree with. I think we need more of that today in the church is we are just so into this place where we can't say anything that anyone believes is off because we want to show honor. Now, we need to show honor. We need to show love in what we say. But anyway, this is not an, in any way an attack against the person. It's an, it is more of... Uh, explaining the, the statements he's making. And so I just want to just say that just to, just to make it clear. The, the first thing that Chris says is, I will not embrace an end-time worldview that re-empowers a disempowered devil. So if you read that, you're, you're kind of like, okay, that sounds, wait. You know, you, I mean, you, you kind of read that and you kind of go, amen, you know? But what it really is, is this mocking against futurists, and I'm just going to use the word futurist because a futurist is one is what I believe, what I am. A futurist is one who believes the prophecies of Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation are going to be fulfilled in the future. They have not been, they were not fulfilled in 70 AD. They're still remaining to be fulfilled at the end of the age. And so basically what this is saying is futurists are somehow giving the devil power he was stripped of at the cross because we believe the devil is going to rage in the last three and a half years of this age. You get that? So you see, that you see a little bit of that tone of mocking. The second one is, I will not accept an eschatology that takes away my children's future and creates mindsets that undermine the mentality of leaving a legacy. Now again, I am a futurist and there have been extremes in, the, in eschatology. There have been people that have just said, we're getting out of here. The Lord's coming back soon. We're going to quit our job. We're going to go, you know, go off into the mountains and just wait for Jesus to come back. And you know what? They've been wrong every time. They wasted away their future. Now, we, you know, I'm a futurist, but I believe that's very extreme. But the answer to that is not to go to the other extreme and say that, you know, this stuff has already been fulfilled. It's possible to both watch for the signs of Jesus' coming and plan for a blessed future. And I want to encourage you, even as you study the end times, even as you, you know, when you study the end times and you really get into it, you're going to walk away with this feeling of, okay, the Lord's coming back soon. The Lord's coming back soon. I want to encourage you, yes, that's probably true, but that does not mean you should not plan for a blessed future. You should plan ahead because, you know, like I said, a lot of people thought the Lord was coming and, and they've been wrong every single time. 
So we're watching for the Lord's coming and planning for a blessed future. Number three, he says, I will not tolerate any theology that sabotages the clear command of Jesus to make disciples of all nations and the Lord's prayer that earth would be like heaven. And the implication is that some futurists have abandoned their responsibility to, to disciple nations. Now that's obviously some, some have, but many futurists have not at all. Many futurists are, are fully on into missions, making disciples in the nations. And you know, we're, we're, we're right now, we're uh, training thousands of pastors in Africa through our distance learning program. We are full on board into missions and discipling the nations. We have not abdicated that responsibility. So, you know, it, it is possible to, to be a futurist and to disciple nations at the same time. Number four, is I will not allow any interpretation of the scriptures that destroys hope for the nations and undermines our command to restore ruined cities. Again, the implication is futurists are pessimistic. Futurists are negative. Futurists are doom and gloom. And, you know, I've said it over and over again, I believe the end times are the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. I believe that the end times will be very challenging, but they also will be the church's finest hour. I believe it's possible, I believe when I read scripture that I see both. I see both a glorious church rising up at the end of the age and great shakings and pressures that are coming. And so futurists are, you know, there are definitely some that have become very negative and pessimistic and, you know, the Antichrist is just going to come and defeat everything. And so, but I believe, I believe it's possible in reading the scriptures that there is both hope and challenge. I believe we're going to witness the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in history. I believe we're going to see uh, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's going to surpass even the book of Acts. And I'll, we're going to talk about that in a later session. Number five is... I, I will, he says, I will not embrace an eschatology that changes the nature of a good God. Again, the implication is futurist, because they believe Jesus is going to release 21 judgments in Revelation 6 through 19, the seal, bowl, and trumpet, the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments, that the futurists are changing the nature of God's goodness from being a God of goodness to a God of judgment. You see the problem with that, the scoffing, the mocking kind of tone in that. Is I believe, just from reading scripture, I believe that God is good, obviously. I believe, I believe the scriptures are very clear. God is both very kind and very severe. God is both very good and very loving. God is, is just filled with hope and love, but at the same time, he releases judgments. And so... You know, this idea that we're changing, futurists are changing the nature of a good God because we believe in judgments is absolutely unscriptural. I mean, it's, it's clear in scripture that Jesus himself in the book of Revelation is releasing 21 judgments to the earth and that has not yet been fulfilled. But, but preterists believe that already has been fulfilled. And we're going to get into preterism in the next session. So you see that. So number six is he said, I refuse to embrace any mindset that celebrates bad news as a sign of the times and a necessary requirement for the return of Jesus. The implication being that futurists, whenever we hear of wars or we hear of an earthquake or we hear of devastation, that futurists get excited and say, Jesus is coming back soon. I don't know anyone. I know a lot of futurists who believe that the prophecies haven't yet been filled. I don't know of anyone that rejoices in bad news. I certainly don't rejoice in bad news. I don't look at it and say, okay, all right, you know, something bad happened. Jesus is coming back soon. You know, I don't believe that at all. I believe you can be a futurist and also grieve at the bad things that are happening. You know, we do rejoice that Jesus is coming back soon, but we don't take pleasure in any kind, uh, any kind of bad news. Number seven. I am opposed to any doctrinal position that pushes the promises of God into a time zone that cannot be obtained in my generation and therefore takes away any responsibility I have to believe God for them in my lifetime. So as a futurist, I believe there are certainly promises that are reserved for the next age. That, when, that there's some promises that cannot be fulfilled until Jesus literally comes back. 
But that doesn't mean I don't believe that a lot of futurists also believe in a great end time move of the spirit of God. I, and I believe that wholeheartedly we are going to witness the ultimate fulfilling of Joel chapter 2. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and you will have dreams and visions and you will have signs in the heavens and signs on the earth. Uh, I'm going to show you in a later session. I don't believe that was ultimately and completely fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, I believe we're going to have a day when the Lord releases the ultimate fulfillment of that promise. So I believe that great, amazing things are coming, but I also know there's, there's definitely some promises that are reserved, not for this age, but for the next age. And we don't have the say of whether we want them to come to pass now or not. And I think we should believe for whatever God will give us, obviously. Number eight is I don't believe, or this is what Chris said, I don't believe that the last days are a time of judgment. Nor do I believe God gave the church the right to call for wrath for sinful cities. There is a day of judgment in which God will judge man, not us. And, and so obviously as a futurist, I strongly disagree with that statement because Jesus himself said that the, his return would be just like the days of Noah. Well, what were the days of Noah? It was eight people were saved and multitudes, millions and millions, tens of millions were killed by God's judgments. And I believe it's, the scriptures are very clear, and I mentioned it earlier, Revelation 6 through 19, Jesus is going to release 21 judgments in the form of seals, trumpets, and bowls that are going to release judgment on the earth. So, so to say that, that the end times are not a time of judgment, I do not know. The only way you can have that kind of view is to believe that the prophecies in Revelation and Matthew 24 have already been fulfilled, which I strongly disagree with. So my point in saying all that, my point in saying all that is I, I, I think it's very important that, that now the body of Christ begins to understand what people really are teaching. It's not to bash people. It's not to divide people because... My, my concern is that there, there's a tremendous amount of scoffing and mocking rising up within the church. Just like Peter said, just like Peter said. I'm going to show you the reason why this is happening here in a second. And if you look here, let's, let's keep going in Peter. 2 Peter 3 is, now I'm going to read here, is verse 4, is, or actually verse 5. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago. Let me just actually get down to verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Now, Keep that phrase in mind about the patience of the Lord. Now, let's go down here a little bit further in this scripture and, and down to verse 15. And again, you see Peter is still talking about the patience of the Lord. He says, regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. Now, this, listen in verse 16. As also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things. So in other words, Peter, what Peter is saying here is that Paul in his epistles spoke about the second coming. Uh, Paul in his epistles spoke about the end of the age. Paul in his epistles spoke about the return of Jesus Christ. Now notice what Peter said. He said he spoke about these things. And he says, some of these things are hard to understand, right? Wouldn't you agree? Some things about the end of the age are hard to understand. I mean, who would argue that the, uh, the beast and the harlot in Revelation 17 are, are easy to understand? I mean, it's taken me years and years of diligent study to really go, okay, what does this mean? I mean, some of the things in the end, uh, talking about the end times, are very difficult to understand. And so... You know, some of the things that Paul wrote about are difficult to understand. Some things about the rapture are difficult to understand. Some things about Israel are difficult to understand. Some things about the bride of Christ are difficult to understand. And so Peter is saying here, these things are difficult to understand. Now listen to what he says, which the untaught 
and the unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Here's what Peter is saying. The rest of the scriptures would mean those scriptures not related to the end times. Peter is saying to us the, the, the source of scoffing and mocking that's going to arise up within the church are going to come from those who are untrained in eschatology. They're going to distort eschatology. They're going to distort the different puzzle pieces of eschatology. And because of that distortion, therefore, there's going to come from that mocking and scoffing. An example like I just showed you. And it's all over the body of Christ. I mean, I, I had, you know, I, I was going to list many, many more examples, but for the sake of time, I decided not to. But I mean, I'm seeing it all over the place, all over the place. It is rising above social media, mocking and scoffing. A lot of times Christians really don't know that it is mocking and scoffing because they don't really know underneath the marketing slogan they see on social media or underneath the thing that's said, underneath that, like an iceberg, is a whole doctrinal belief system that says the, the prophecies in Matthew 24 in the book of Revelation have already been fulfilled. And they just look at the marketing slogan and go, amen, and they have no idea what the person is teaching. And so I'm going to talk about some things people are teaching, especially in, in the later sessions. But the root cause of scoffing and mocking is because teachers are teaching about the end times and they are untrained to teach about eschatology. They're untrained to teach about the end times and therefore they are distorting the scriptures and in their distortion of scriptures, it's leading many, many people into deception. Very important, very, very important that we, we, we make studying the end times a high priority in our lives. Now, what we're going to do now in this session is talk about a love for the truth. Because we're going to go on a journey together. To understand the end times, we're going to go on a journey together to understand this, okay? There's so many things that we're going to go through. We're going to talk about so many different topics, but I've, and this is from my own experience, I just got to say, trust me in this, is you're going to have to unlearn a lot of things you have thought were accurate to really arrive at the truth. A lot, a lot of us bring in baggage. A lot of us bring in things and presumptions, assumptions, teachings, false teachings. Some are right, some are not right. And we've got to lay down our baggage we're bringing into this to say, okay, Lord, you show me the truth. And so I'm going to talk about six different things that we need to establish and cultivate a love for the truth. A love for the truth in this day and age is so important. I mean, it is so vital that we have a love for the truth. And in fact, let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, another highly important scripture. In fact, this is one of the scriptures that Peter referenced when he talked about Paul writing about difficult things to understand. It was obviously uh, Thessalonians and some of the other things Paul talked about. But Paul, in verse 3, he's talking about, see, what happened in Thessalonica is the believers, it was going around in the believers, and they were saying, okay, the day of the Lord has already come. And so all the believers in Thessalonica were like panicking and thinking, oh, no, the day of the Lord has already come. He's already come back. And Paul's like, listen, no, 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 folks, you got it wrong. Let no one deceive you in any way. The day of the Lord has not come. The day of the Lord is not going to come. Listen to what he says in verse 3. He says, the day of the Lord, now the day of the Lord is the last three and a half years of the age when God unleashes, the, or Jesus unleashes the 21 judgments in Revelation 6 through 19. He says, the day of the Lord is not going to come until the apostasy comes first. That word apostasy means a falling away. It means a defection. It means turning from one person to another person. Turning from Jesus Christ to the Antichrist. Turning from Christianity to the harlot religion in Revelation 17 and 18. Listen to this. This should put the fear of God on every one of us, including myself. A great apostasy is coming. 
a great falling away is coming. Some people say we've already entered into that. I don't. I disagree. I think we've 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 it started, but I don't think the fullness is anywhere close to where it's going. Going. A great falling away is coming. A great apostasy is coming. That means believers in Jesus Christ are going to. Re- we've already seen some of this. Are going to renounce their faith and say, I believe in this. I believe in this universal religion, a mixture of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. I believe I'm renouncing Jesus Christ, and I'm going to go along the the way of the Antichrist. It's going to be a great apostasy, not a small one, a great one. Now, that's, that's the fear of God should come into this. Now, that does not mean we should be afraid of deception. We should be, we should fear God. All right, so some people can get so afraid of deception, they start panicking and, you know, we're never to be moved by the fear of deception. We're to be moved by the fear of God. If we fear God, we will not be deceived. If we fear God, we will not be deceived. All right? Now, the reason for the apostasy is down in verse 10, is it says, Talking about the Antichrist, he's coming with the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Listen to what he says. Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. It's the love of the truth. It's vital we love the truth. And the truth ultimately is a person, Jesus. But we want to love the truth. If we don't love the truth, we are opening our hearts to deception. And I'm telling you, if you think it's deceptive now, just wait. I mean, it is going to get so deceptive. It's going to get so deceptive that Jesus said even the elect could be deceived if possible. Again, fear God, don't fear deception. But we want to right now We want to develop a love for the truth right now so that we are not deceived. Now now notice what verse 11 says. Take note, what I'm about to tell you is in your Bible. It's not just in my Bible. I'm not reading from the Brian translation. Paul said this, all right? This is not something I'm saying and just coming up with. Listen, Listen to what Paul said. Basically, for this reason, because they did not receive the love of the truth, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they may all be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. That's sobering. God, God himself is going to send a great delusion, not the devil. God himself is going to send a great delusion upon those who do not love the truth. Our safeguard, as we study the end of the age, our safeguard is a love for the truth. We've got to love the truth. In fact, let's just take one second here and just where you are, just ask the Lord to give you a love for the truth. Just agree with me. I'm going to pray it for myself, and you pray it for yourself as well. Lord, I pray right now for everyone listening, Lord, whether it's in person or online, that you would give us a love for the truth. Give us a love for the truth so as to be saved, that we would not be swept away with the great delusion that's coming even into the church. I pray that we would truly love the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm talking now about six different things that are going to help us love the truth. Now, the first one is love the truth, is what I just talked about. The second one is what we're doing right now is we're laying the groundwork to bring us into some deeper teachings. And I'm I'm sharing this from my own experience. These are things I have learned from my own experience of wanting to go deeper in certain topics, whether it's about the Antichrist or the rapture or whatever, you know, whether the prophecies are fulfilled in 70 AD or whether they're going to be, you know, whether they haven't been fulfilled, all that stuff. 
All that, uh, we're going through six different things that are helping us to develop a love for the truth. The, the second one is we want to love the truth more than we love your favorite minister. That would be me. No, I'm just kidding. Your favorite minister, your favorite ministry, or your favorite movement. How, how many times have I been burned by this? I mean, I, let me just explain is what, you know, a lot of times, just, I'm just talking about my experience, growing up, just seeking the Lord and stuff like that. You know, when you first start getting in the Lord, you, you're, you're, in, you're insecure about some things. You're insecure, okay, is this really true? Is what I'm seeing in Scripture, is that really accurate? Um, you, you feel kind of, you lack confidence about it. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. I, I certainly have. Or you feel like, okay, I don't want to walk alone. I want to be a part of something bigger you know, you, you have these feelings, and so you, you get to this place where you hear someone, and they're very smart, and they're very eloquent, and they have a lot of influence, and then they teach something, and you're, you're the first thing you say, okay, well, this has to be right because this person teaching it is smart, he's influential, he's charismatic, he moves in signs and wonders, he has prophetic encounters and experiences, you know what I'm saying? And so you kind of think, okay, this has to be true because this guy is saying this, or this guy is teaching that. I don't know, you're, at, you're looking at me like you've never experienced that. I've experienced that a lot. I, in my own life, I have realized, okay, so many times what, what I feel like the Lord has shown me, I've kind of compromised on that because this person is influential or this person is eloquent and smart and says something different. And I'm just going to say, if we're going to love the truth, if we want to get to the love of the truth, we have to love the truth more than our favorite minister. I can assure you in this teach in this class, we'll probably, some of our heroes maybe might be teaching error that I'm going to call out. So we cannot love our spiritual heroes more than we love the truth. We got to love the truth more than any minister. We got to love the truth more than our denomination more than our favorite movement. So if we're going to develop a love for the truth, we've got to love the truth more than our favorite teacher. It doesn't matter how eloquent. It doesn't matter how influential. If it's not in Scripture, if, you, if it is contrary to Scripture, don't receive it. That doesn't mean some other things they teach is, is error. You know, we got to get to the point where we can take the meat from the bones and realize, okay, that's true, that's true, that's true. Okay, that's not true. I'm going to receive this, this, and this, but I'm not going to receive that. You see what I'm saying? We've gotten to this place, and I think it's part of society that we live in now, where everything is so extreme. If they say one thing that's off, we think everything they've ever said is off. No. Just that one thing's off. The other things they've said is right. We've got to love the truth more than our favorite minister, more than our favorite movement. I and mean, I've had to do this over and over with Dad. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. That was a joke. Dad, dad is obviously awesome. That was a complete joke. No, it was a complete joke. It was a complete joke. It wasn't a very good joke, but it was a complete joke. But, you know, all of us have had to do that. You know, all of us have had to, you know, all of us have done that. Well, I'm not smart enough. He's smart. Therefore, I think what he's saying is right. And I've seen it over and over and over. And so, you know, my question to you is, as we start this, as we start this teaching, especially when we get into some other things, preterism, postmillennialism, different errors, as we get into even talking about the rapture, and I guarantee you, we're, when we get into talking about the rapture, someone is going to forget that I said this teaching, and they're going to send me an email going, ah, da, 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 da. you know, the rapture brings out, I mean, I just even got an email recently, I mean, the, the, the rapture brings out passion in people like I've never seen, I and mean, there's so much emotion in it. And so I just want to say, okay, don't forget these little principles I'm teaching you right now. You're going to need them later on. You're going to need them, I promise you. So let me ask you some questions. Is, are you going to believe what someone teaches just because you like them or have been blessed by their ministry? Or are you going to believe what the Word says? Are you going to hold to something because you identify with their movement or their denomination? I mean, how many people... Have, have or, or believe, and I'm going to get into the rapture later, but how many people believe in a pre-trib rapture just because their denomination teaches it and they've never really examined whether it's in Scripture or not? Don't let that throw you off. And I mean, goodness, 
If you, if you tell someone something about the rapture, they immediately go, I'm stop, I'm, I'm done. You know, just, just hold on. <laughs> I'm going to get into the rapture later, all right? So hold on, hold on. I, I just want to say, are you believing in a, in a doctrine? Are you believing in a teaching because your favorite ministry or your favorite denomination believes it or because you see it in Scripture? Will you carefully examine the teaching in light of Scripture and hold fast to the truth? See, so important that we get that way. So important. The third thing, this is big as well, loving the truth is more important than unity. Say it again. Loving the truth is more important than unity. Now let me say this. I love organic unity. I love the fact of what Jesus prayed. God, make them one even as I and the Father are one. There's nothing greater to me than unity. There's nothing, you know, I, like Psalms 133 says, it's how good and how pleasant it is when the brethren dwell together in unity is the place where the anointing flows from the head to the feet. There's nothing more precious to me than unity. When, when you get together with other Christ followers around Jesus, the person of Jesus, and his word, and you just have this incredible unity, this oneness of heart that, that is just something only the Holy Spirit can create. There's nothing greater to me than that. It is just incredible. I mean, the unity God is going to bring at the end of the age, he is going to unify his church unlike we have ever seen. And I want to be right at the center of that. However, there is also a false unity movement. And it's in the church already. It's leading to Revelation 17 and 18. It's leading to we will build a tower. We will rebuild Babel. We will build a tower and we will exalt our name and you know, build it to heaven just like they did in Genesis 11. That There's a false unity movement in the church already where they say, this is already being talked about, is unity is more important than doctrine. And so they're uniting, like charismatics are uniting with Catholics who have complete, total different ideologies and theologies and saying, we're just we're going to center around the person of Jesus. That's nonsense. You do not unify around uh, just unity for the sake of unity. Unity is around Jesus Christ and his truth. And so... We can never, and I'm not, this does not mean, you know, you, you got to agree perfectly to be in unity. If we, if we waited to, for that to happen, no one would ever be in unity until Jesus comes back. None of us are going to agree perfectly on everything, but what, what is happening in the church right now is we're saying, okay, we're not going to talk about doctrinal errors. We're not going to talk about things that are wrong or whatever. We're not going to talk about those things because we're going to love each other in Jesus' name. And so what's happening is people all over the place are compromising the truth of God's word for the sake of unity. And the, 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 the powers of darkness are very crafty, very deceptive. They know that they know they want to manipulate the love in our hearts and the compassion in our hearts for one another. They want to manipulate that so we will compromise the truth. And that's leading to Revelation 17 and 18. It's leading to a harlot church who is going to be deceived. I want to say truth is very important. God is big enough to create unity and to, to form unity within his church by us not having to compromise on the truth. You don't have to compromise on the truth to be in unity. Jesus is big enough to do that himself. We do not need to be guilted into unity there's a lot of guilting into unity. Well, we just need to be in unity because the Lord commanded it. Well, not if your doctrine is just so full of error. I'm not going to unify around that. And you shouldn't either. It's going to lead you into compromise. Be very careful who you let influence you. Be very careful who you make allegiances with. Be very careful because there is so much deception out there. Make sure the Lord gives you the release to be in unity with this person or that person. That doesn't mean we're jerks or anything like that. That doesn't mean, you know, we're not showing love and kindness or anything like that. You can actually be nice and be kind, but not join together heart to heart with someone who is fully in disagreement or, or not fully in agreement truth-wise. There are three doctrines to me that for me personally, 
I could never walk in unity with someone or agreement with someone if they believe these. Number one would be universalism. There is going to come a move within the church. It's already in here in seed form, but it's going to come in a much greater way. Universalism, meaning that uh, Muslims will go to heaven, Jews will go to heaven apart from Christ. Uh, you know, you know, uh, different religions. Uh, you know, there's, there's many ways that lead to heaven, and many ways that lead to salvation. That is going to be the one of the ultra uh, mantras of this one world religion that's being raised up is universalism. You know, the, how could you say that, you know, the Muslims can't go to heaven and, you know, you're so narrow-minded, you're so bigoted. And so there's no way if someone says, you know, to me, it's like there is, you cannot compromise on that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. There is no other way. He is the way and the truth and the life. There is no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ. I don't care if that sounds narrow-minded or bigoted to you. I am not going to compromise on, on universalism. Absolutely not. The second one I could never walk in unity with is hyper-grace. The teaching that, that, that takes God's incredible grace... And I, you know, I'm a, I'm a full-on believer in God's grace. It's all throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament. I love God's grace. I need God's grace more and more and more. Uh, we all need God's grace. It is the central part of the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. You know, so, but there is a movement right now that's taking God's grace to an unbiblical extreme and it's become hyper-grace, and it's leading the church into sin, it's leading the church into compromise, it's leading the church away from the person of Jesus Christ, it's leading them into all kinds of fleshly sins that's defiling the bride of Christ. And so, for me, I could never be in unity with someone who teaches hyper-grace. The third thing I could not personally be in unity with someone with is someone who teaches preterism. Someone who teaches, whether it's full preterism that says all the prophecies have been fulfilled or partial preterism that says most of the prophecies have been fulfilled, for me personally, I could not do that. I, I mean, because so much of that revolves around we're living in the time, I, I believe, when Jesus is coming back soon and the, and the book of Revelation and Matthew 24 are being fulfilled. And so to me, in my opinion, one of the doctrines I could never unify around would be preterism. That's just my belief. It's that important. I'm going to, and some of you might go, why would you include that with universalism and hyper grace? I'm going to talk about that in the next session. But to me, it, it, it is so important because the, the rise of preterism, saying that the prophecies have already been fulfilled is just increasing like nothing I've ever seen over the past 10 years. I mean, it is spreading throughout the body of Christ. Number four is study the prophetic scriptures for yourself with a humble, teachable heart. Study the prophetic scriptures for yourself with a humble, teachable heart. So let me just give you a little bit of an insight here. What happens with end-time teachers? It happens with any teachers, but especially end-time teachers, because end-time teachings really sell books. So what happens is a teacher gets a revelation, they think, and that revelation they turn into a book, they turn into a course. That book then becomes popular. That course then goes viral, and millions are watching it. They then become, that then becomes a source of income for them, it then becomes a source of fame and influence for them. Their identity begins to be shaped by that. Even if someone comes along and says, here's the error in what you're teaching, one, two, three, and four, because of the money, the influence, and the identity for that teacher, they cannot ever renounce what they teach. And so they keep on teaching error. I don't know if you've ever realized that, but that's happening all over the place. Beware of hidden agendas. Beware. There, there are hidden agendas everywhere, especially in these related to the end times. Hidden agendas. Discern the hidden agenda. Beware of the hidden agenda. Because the, the, the truth is what we have to hold on to. Because what I've seen again and again is someone will write their book, they'll become famous with their course. Someone will come along with this perfectly precise, concise 
re, uh, refuting what they have written from Scripture, and yet they still come in and they twist and cherry pick and try to put all these different verses here to support their doctrine that's error, and they, yet they still influence millions of people. I mean, I, I just, I'm thinking of one person in particular. He just recently posted something that was totally filled with error, and million, I think over a million people watched it online. And I'm thinking to myself, God, where has the discernment gone in the body of Christ? Well, I know where it's gone. Most of the church doesn't even read their Bibles anymore. But we've got to be people who are like the Bereans who study the scriptures for themselves to see if this is true. This doesn't mean we're unteachable. We need to be very teachable. But it means we're not gullible. It means we go back to the scriptures for ourselves and don't just say, okay, because this person said it and this person's influential and this person's popular and this person wrote this book or whatever, we want to go and say, okay, show me in the scriptures. And I would say the same thing with me. If anything I'm saying and teaching is not in the scriptures, hold me accountable to that and, and come to me and talk to me. So we've got, to, we, we've got to love the scriptures. We've got to love what the scriptures are teaching. Amen? We want to be like the believers at Berea. They were noble-minded, and they examined the scriptures thoroughly to see if what Paul was teaching was true. And so I just want to encourage you, as you go through this teaching, in time teaching, take what I say and examine it thoroughly. Become a student of end time prophecy. Become a student and say, okay, yes, what he is saying is in scripture. No, what, no I, don't, I don't think you're gonna say this. Hopefully you will not. But if you do, if, if anything comes that I've said that's not in scriptural, you know, pray about it and come talk to me. Please, you know, because I want to be scriptural. I, you know, I, I wanna hopefully get to that place where no matter anything I write or say, no matter what I write or say, if it's not in scripture, if something can come up and refute what I have said, I want to have, hopefully, God help me, have the humility to say, okay, you know what? I said this and I taught this, but it was not accurate. Okay? We want to, to come with a humble, teachable heart. I want to encourage you as we are starting this teaching is start with a blank slate. I don't know where you're at in terms of end time prophecy. You might be one of those that have studied it for years and think you've got everything solved. I want to, and, you know, that's kind of where I would come from. I, you know, I just want to say to myself and you, if you're that, that's you, let's, let's start again with a blank slate. Let's start again with a humble heart. Maybe if, you know, you're not really that far, but maybe somewhere in the middle and you're saying, I've, I know some about the end times, but I still need to learn some more. Start with a blank slate. Humble yourself. Ask the Lord to teach you. Ask the Lord to show you. It, and I'm saying this, this is so important for the times we live in, for God to give us understanding. We've got to have understanding for the times we live in, especially of the end of the age. Start with a blank slate. Let go of your preconceived ideas. Let go of your accumulated knowledge. Let go of some of the teaching you think is, is spot on. And I'm not saying God will probably confirm that a lot of that what you believe is actually true, but be willing to let go of those things. Let go of your opinions, your prejudices, your assumptions, and your presumptions. See, I did this as, so just to give you a little bit of my experiences, when I, you know, I mentioned last week, I've studied the end times for 25 plus years, but for about the last 10 years, I've really focused in on God's eternal purpose, the indwelling life of Christ, the cross, and, and things like that. And so I hadn't really studied the end times in depth like I had before. And so as I was preparing for this class, you know, I, I, I did this myself. I said, okay, I'm going to start with a blank slate. Okay, um, I, I think I have... I think I have understanding about what the rapture is. I think I have understanding about Israel. I think I have understanding about the Antichrist or Harlot Babylon or, you know, preterism, postmillennialism, all those different things. I think I understand those things and I have a very firm conviction about that. But you know what? I'm going to start with a blank sheet of paper. I'm going to, I'm going to let go of my prejudice. I'm going to let go of my opinions, my assumptions and presumptions. And I'm going to come to the Lord. And I did this for... 
I don't know, a month or a month and a half, two months before I started writing this class, and I said, Lord, you teach me. You teach me. I'm coming to the scriptures, and I'm coming to the Spirit of God, and I'm coming in prayer, and I'm saying, Lord, you teach me. I don't want to just believe something because someone popular taught it. I don't want to believe something because of, of my favorite denomination or movement taught it. Lord, you teach me. I don't, and I want to encourage you, don't just believe it because I say it. You go to the Word yourself and ask the Lord to teach you. Go to the Lord yourself. So many Christians today are not going into the Word themselves. They're not going to the Lord himself and saying, Lord, you teach me, you show me. They're just accepting what the preacher says as 100% truth and you know, without examining it. Don't be that person. Don't be that person. Number four, let's look at, um, or number five, break free from end time doctrines of demons. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter four, verse one. Listen to the warning Paul gave. He says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some are going to fall away from the faith. There we see the apostasy again. Paying, how are they going to do it? They're going to pay attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Paul is telling us, doctrines of demons are going to be on the increase at the end of the age. Doctrines of demons are on the increase right now. And those doctrines of demons, listen, if not confronted in love, will lead the body of Christ astray into the great apostasy. It's that important. Some doctrines of demons need to be hit with a sledgehammer. They need to be pulverized. I'll say that again. I think the Lord was on that. I think that was the exclamation point. If you're listening online, right when I made that last point, our power, our lights just went out. So I'll say that again. I think God was amening that. Some doctrines of demons, let's we'll see if I can make it happen again. Some doctrines of demons need to be hit with a sledgehammer and pulverized. Some doctrines of demons need to be taken out with a scalpel very tenderly, very gently, so that the truth that's in there is not uh, ruined. Because some of it is just laced in with some little bit of error here and there. Some is just full out error. So we've got to hit it with a, we've got to hit it with a sledgehammer and a scalpel. We've got to hit it both with a hammer of God's word and with that tender, gentle, loving, Slight correction. But, I mean, this is where I'm coming from. The, the, Paul was saying in the latter days, in the latter days, the Holy Spirit is warning. He warned in the first century, and he's shouting it now to us. In the latter times, some are going to fall away from the faith because they're paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. We're going to look at two doctrines of demons in the next two sessions. Preterism. I'm going to show you clearly why preterism is a doctrine of demons and why it is absolutely un, it's untenable. It cannot be true. It's absolutely untrue. Yeah, I'm going to debunk it. And I'm going to probably take the hammer out for that one because that one is absolute doctrine of demons. And the next one we're going to look at is a seven mountain mandate that says... We're gonna, we've got we to invade the culture and conquer the seven mountains of culture for the kingdom of God. That one, to me, needs some hammer and some scalpel. There's some good and there's some things not good in that. We're going to confront all of that stuff. But the point is, the apostasy that's coming is going to be, is going to be led by doctrines of demons and deceitful spirits coming from within the church. Not coming from without the church. So what is a doctrine of demon? A doctrine of demons is a teaching inspired by hell. It's designed to lead as many as possible to fall away from the faith. It's a craftily arranged teaching, making use of scriptures taking out of context to promote ideas that are inconsistent with scripture. And we're going to look at some of these in, in, 
We're going to look at some of these, preterism, postmillennialism, seven mountain mandate, replacement theology. We're going to look at all those in this class. As I mentioned, when I was writing the 2000, in 2009, the end time class, when I was writing that class, I debated, should I talk about any of these, like preterism, postmillennialism? I hadn't even heard of Seven Mountain back then. Should I even talk about any of those? And I decided the only one I'm going to talk about right now is replacement theology because preterism and postmillennialism didn't have a lot of following. At least that was my impression back then. They didn't have a lot of following. It wasn't that popular. And so I was like, okay, I only have a limited amount of space to write, so I'm not going to talk about those things. But I'm looking at 11 years later. I, I mean... I would estimate half the charismatic church is moving in a direction towards preterism, some form of it, and post-millennialism. I mean, half of it. I mean, I'm telling you, it has increased dramatically over the last 10, 11 years. And so that's why I'm going to really talk about it, explain it, explain where they're coming from, and explain why I don't believe it's accurate. Jeremiah 1.10 talks about that, that before we can build and plant, we've got to uproot, we've got to pluck out, we've got to uh, take out and, and destroy before we can build and plant. Yeah, a great example of it is our church building is, you know, I remember, I'll never forget that day when we first came in here and this was a, our church building was an old office building. And we had to bring out the sledgehammers and everyone had their gloves on. And, you know, we were just tearing down uh, ceiling tiles and sheetrock and all that stuff. And, and you know, it's like, man, it was, a, it was a total absolute mess. And sometimes you just have to tear it down to the very foundation before you can start building again. And, but the end product was beautiful. I mean, this is so beautiful what God has done and used us to do. But it, when we're coming, talking about the end times and things like that, a lot of times we got to get the sledgehammer out and just destroy the faults and the, the errors so we can build and establish the true. And that's what we're going to be doing in this class, especially in the next two sessions. Number six is we've got to embrace theological tension and don't overreact to eschatological extremes. That's kind of long words, but here's what I mean by that. So many, and I, I'm just studying this so, for so many years. So many believers have gone from one end of the pendulum to the other because they overreacted to some extremes from some people who embrace certain end time teachings. Now, the, the way I like to explain, the way I like to explain the end times is: everyone remember the Rubik's cube? I remember this became popular when I was, I don't know, probably eight years old, eight, you know, nineteen, whatever, nineteen eighty, eighty five. I used to love doing the Rubik's Cube. I have an analytical mind. I think I finally solved this like once or twice without any step-by-step -step guide. But, you know, if you do the Rubik's Cube, this is the way interpreting end-time prophecy is like. You know, you do the Rubik's Cube and you get one side. So maybe you get red and everything's done and you think, okay, I got it. And then you get green. You got red and green. And then you look and you think you're about to solve it. But then you realize the, the pieces here are out of alignment. And you twist and you turn and you get it back and you realize you've messed up the whole thing and you've got to go back to square one. The end times are kind of like that. Everything has to come into alignment. What John says in Revelation has to align with what Daniel says in his book, has to align with what Isaiah says, has to align with what Paul says, has to align with what Peter and the other apostles said. In other words, you can't just cherry pick certain scriptures out of context and formulate a doctrine out of it. Scripture has to interpret scripture. It has to be consistent with the full flow of Scripture from the Old Testament prophets to the New Testament prophets and apostles. And so, you know, so, so many times I think, okay, you know, if I'm applying this to Israel, okay, I've got Israel figured out. I've got the, the satanic kingdoms of Revelation 17 figured out. I've got the rapture figured out. And you, you, you look at it and you go, wait, no, these border pieces don't line up. And you realize, okay, Everything has to come into alignment. So my point is, is we have to know the scriptures to interpret the scriptures. The scriptures will never contradict themselves. Whatever Ezekiel says will confirm what Joel says. Whatever Isaiah says will confirm what Daniel and John wrote. In other words, everything has to come into alignment. And that means we're going to have to embrace some tension. We're going to have to embrace theological tension 
You know, here, here's a word for you, paradox. This is a great way to think about it. A lot of end time teachings are a paradox. It seems at first as if it's self-contradictory. In other words, it seems like this is true and this true, this is true, but how can these two things be true at the same time? Well, sometimes there's a paradox in it. You know, some examples of paradoxes is you, if you give, you receive. If you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. You know, those are some of the, uh, you know, paradoxes we see in Scripture is you gain by losing, you live by dying, those, those kind of things. But there's also end-time paradoxes that we have to embrace is that God has both blinded part of Israel and chosen Israel. The Antichrist is both, the beast Antichrist is both a person and a kingdom. We are overcomers in Christ and we must overcome. The kingdom is now, but not yet. The Lord is going to reveal his kindness and his severity. Jesus is a shepherd, and he's also the Lion of Judah. See, there's paradoxes all throughout the scriptures, and so we've got to embrace the tension in scripture without going to one extreme or the other. And I've listened to several preterists a lot of a lot of times people a lot of people who were formerly believed as futurist went into preterism because they saw the extremes especially if you hear any testimonies of those in the Jesus movement as they saw the extremes the the book late great planet earth by Hal Lindsey a multi-million dollar bestseller everyone in that movement, that Jesus people movement, so many were just like, Jesus is coming back any moment. We're going to sell our property and all our possessions and move to the mountains because he's coming back soon. Well, you know, 50, 60, 70 years later, however many years that was, 1970, anyway, 50 years later, Jesus has not yet come back and many grew disillusioned. Many were like that end time teaching, it wasn't even true. And so they went from the extreme of this futurist extreme where they were, you know, went to the mountains waiting for Jesus to rapture them, all the way into full-blown preterism saying the prophecies have been fulfilled in 70 AD. Don't overreact to the extremes. Another example is Israel. So for 2,000 years or 1,800 years when Israel was, n was not a nation, most of the church embraced replacement theology. They would read the Old Testament prophets and they would substitute the church in place of Israel. Now, that makes perfect sense because if Israel's not a nation and the Jewish people are not in Israel, the only way you can make sense of it is to say, okay, well, that must mean the church has replaced Israel. Well, then Israel becomes a nation in 1948 and everything begins to change. Replacement theology begins to be exposed for what it really is, a doctrine of demons, but then the, the evangelical church goes way to the other extreme and thinks, okay, Israel can never do anything wrong. You know, everything Israel does is righteous. You know, the, and basically it almost gets to this place where the Jews have replaced Christ. And some, seeing those extremes, have now gone back to replacement theology. And, and so my point is, don't overreact to the extremes you have seen let the truth of Scripture balance those because the truth is always found in the middle. You know, the Venn diagram with the circles, the, the intersecting circles, right that sweet spot of the messy middle, that is where the truth is when it comes to the end times. So I want to encourage you, when we examine the truth, don't resist the urge to go to the extremes because of people who've gone to the extreme. Stay right in what Scripture teaches. Amen? And so we'll just wrap up this session by saying this. Is, it is the love of the truth that is our safeguard. It's the love of the truth that is our safeguard. And so I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you in terms of the love of the truth. Implement these six things into your heart. Especially when we get to any of them. Just start with a blank slate. Humble yourself. Ask the Lord to teach you. Don't just believe it because your favorite minister or movement teaches it. Or don't just accept it because you read it in a book or whatever. Go to the scriptures yourself. I believe we have a small little window of time where the Lord is giving us grace to really examine what we believe so we can be prepared, so we can be ready for the hour we live in. 
So take this opportunity, I want to encourage you, take this opportunity and become a student of end time prophecy yourself. I promise you, you will not regret it. Amen.